Hello, I'm Professor Marcus de Sotoy, and this is a podcast of a brief history of mathematics. This history was first broadcast on BBC Radio 4, and all 10 episodes are now available for you to collect and keep at bbc.co.uk forward slash podcasts. In this, the penultimate episode, the story moves to 20th century Britain where a passion for prime numbers unites two men from different continents. For the British mathematician G. H. Hardy, numbers are better than the football reports for light breakfast table reading. And as a mathematician myself, I must admit that even though I love the sports section, I too prefer figures. Despite their apparent simplicity, numbers, like football, are full of drama, surprises, twists and turns. And of all the numbers in mathematics, it's the prime numbers that are the most exciting. Indivisible numbers like 17 and 23. Understanding prime numbers is the ultimate mathematical challenge. They look so simple, yet as Hardy would write, Every fool can ask questions about prime numbers that the wisest man cannot answer. Hardy was interested in the primes because of their inherent beauty and mystery. He wasn't motivated by utilitarian goals. The real mathematics of the real mathematicians is almost wholly useless. It is not possible to justify the life of any genuine professional mathematician on the ground of the utility of his work. But it was precisely the mathematics that Hardy dedicated his life to that would turn out to be key to creating powerful new codes that protect the secrets that fly across the internet every day. At any one time, millions of people online with their banks. So unless we encode personal private information or bank information, there's a real danger that information could be read by anyone. That's why we need encryption online. The codes that are now being used to keep our bank and other details safe online are based on the curious, and to this day still mysterious, properties of prime numbers. As a child, Hardy used to amuse himself in church, looking at the numbers of the hymns and trying to work out which of the prime numbers they were made from. So, for example, hymn number 15, he could break down into the primes 3 times 5. Hymn number 105 could be built by multiplying together the primes 3, 5 and 7. Every whole number is either prime or it can be made by multiplying together two or more prime numbers. This is why Hardy and I and countless other mathematicians through the ages care so much about prime numbers. They're the building blocks of all numbers. The primes are the most important numbers in mathematics. A brief history of mathematics with Marcus de Sotoy. At the beginning of the 20th century, British mathematics wasn't thriving. Indeed, the subject hadn't really flourished since Newton's work on calculus 300 years before. But Hardy, who became a fellow of mathematics at Trinity College, Cambridge, Newton's old college, put British mathematics back on the map. Hardy's understanding of the mathematical breakthroughs in 19th century Germany changed the course of British mathematics. But it was input from a completely unexpected quarter that was to change his life. Dear sir, I beg to introduce myself to you as a clerk in the accounts department of the Port Trust Office at Madras on a salary of only £20 per annum. I am now about 23 years of age. I have been applying the spare time at my disposal to work at mathematics. I have not trodden through the conventional regular course which is followed in a university course, but I am striking out a new path for myself being poor. If you are convinced that there is anything of value, I would like to have my theorems published. Requesting to be excused for the trouble I give you, I remain, dear sir, yours truly, S. Ramanujan. Hardy nearly threw the letter in the bin. But there was one statement, buried amid pages and pages of handwritten mathematical theorems about prime numbers, that particularly intrigued Hardy. I have found a function of x which exactly represents the number of prime numbers less than x. If Ramanujan had indeed found such a function or formula, Hardy certainly would have been interested. It was only the answer to a problem that had been obsessing him for years, the problem of how the primes are distributed throughout the universe of numbers. But Ramanujan had not divulged what the formula was. 
and Hardy was sceptical about the ability of this untrained Indian mathematician. According to his friend, the writer C.P. Snow, Hardy was not only bored, but irritated. It seemed like a curious kind of fraud. He duly went about the day according to his habits, giving a lecture, playing a game of tennis. But there was something nagging at the back of his mind. Anyone who could fake such theorems, right or wrong, must be a fraud of genius. Was it more or less likely that there should be a fraud of genius or an unknown Indian mathematician of genius? But by the evening, his mood had changed. The mathematical language that Ramanujan used was unorthodox and hard to follow. But there was one formula that particularly struck a chord with Hardy. Ramanujan declared, The sum of one, plus two, plus three, plus four, and so on up to infinity, eventually equals minus one twelfth. To the uninitiated, it seems to make no sense at all. Even Ramanujan noted, If I tell you this, you will at once point out to me the lunatic asylum as my goal. A number of mathematicians to whom Ramanujan had sent his letter before trying Hardy had indeed rejected his ideas as the work of a madman. But this extraordinary formula was familiar to Hardy. He'd read the work of the great German mathematician Bernhard Riemann, who had made sense of these bizarre infinite sums. And it was this that got him excited about Ramanujan's theorems. Ramanujan went on to assert that his mathematics had led to a formula that could calculate the number of primes up to a hundred million. But still, he did not state what the formula was. Hardy summoned his colleague, J.E. Littlewood, to talk to him after their high-table dinner in Trinity. Hardy and Littlewood collaborated on everything, so much so that some believed Hardy Littlewood was a single mathematician. By midnight, they decided... Ramanujan was no crank. He was a genius. Untrained, but brilliant. Hardy wrote back to Ramanujan, praising his work and begging for proofs, and in particular, more details of his formula for primes. Dear Sir, I was exceedingly interested by your letter and the theorems which you state. You will, however, understand that before I can judge properly the value of what you have done, it is essential that I should see proofs of some of your assertions. You will understand that in this theory, everything depends on the rigorous exactitude of proof. Hoping to hear from you again as soon as possible, I am yours very truly, G. H. Hardy. When the second letter came from Madras, Littlewood realised that Ramanujan had not quite achieved all he had claimed. Dear Hardy... The stuff about primes is wrong. It is not surprising that he would have been caught, unsuspicious as he presumably is, of the diabolical malice inherent in the primes. Hardy wrote back to Ramanujan. To have proved what you claimed would have been about the most remarkable mathematical feat in the whole history of mathematics. But that did not change his view that Ramanujan was a genius, and he and Littlewood determined to do whatever it would take to get Ramanujan to Cambridge so that he could be brought up to date with current theories. Ramanujan sailed for England and soon became a familiar sight around Trinity College, wearing the slippers he wore in favour of uncomfortable Western shoes. Ramanujan worked closely with Hardy on many mathematical problems. Cut off from his family, his religion and his culture, Ramanujan became increasingly depressed. He hadn't received any letters from his wife, They'd all been intercepted and destroyed by his jealous mother. The outbreak of the First World War in 1914 had prevented him from returning home. He'd exchanged mathematical isolation in India for the cultural loneliness of Cambridge. During a trip to London, he threw himself in front of an underground train. The driver managed to break in time. Ramanujan survived, but entered a sanatorium against his will, where he stayed for 12 months. When Hardy visited Ramanujan in the sanatorium, all Hardy could think of talking about was the number of the taxi he'd arrived in. 1729, a rather dull number, he ventured. No, Hardy, the patient immediately replied. It is the smallest number expressible as the sum of two cubes in two different ways. Littlewood used to remark that every positive integer is one of Ramanujan's personal friends. At the end of the First World War, Hardy suggested that Ramanujan should return to India for a short period of recuperation. A year later, he heard that Ramanujan 
had died in India at the tragically young age of 33. He was devastated. His originality had been a constant source of suggestion to me ever since I knew him, and his death is one of the worst blows I have ever had. My association with him was the one truly romantic incident of my life. Together with Ramanujan, Hardy made some extraordinary discoveries about a whole range of different numbers. Partition numbers, highly composite numbers, continued fractions. But the one area they failed to make much progress with was the diabolical malice inherent in the primes. Hardy grew increasingly disillusioned by his inability to crack the primes. He hated getting old and would turn all the mirrors round in his rooms so he wouldn't have to look at his ageing face. For him, mathematics was a young person's game. You must not be too old. Mathematics is not a contemplative but a creative subject. No one can draw much consolation from it when he has lost the power or desire to create. And that is apt to happen to mathematicians rather soon. And he too unsuccessfully attempted suicide by taking an overdose. The primes were proving to be a fearsome adversary. In previous episodes of this brief history of mathematics, I've shown how mathematical triumphs often lead to important scientific innovations. In this case, however, it's a mathematical failure that has found a life-changing application. Hardy never did get to the bottom of prime numbers. They remain an enigma even to this day. But the very fact that he and other brilliant mathematicians haven't been able to fully understand the primes is the reason that they are now proving to be so useful. Just decades after Hardy died, computer theorists were looking for tough mathematical problems that hadn't been solved. Internet guru Bill Thompson. Hardy was annoyed about the fact he couldn't find out what the prime numbers were, but of course it's the very fact that it's difficult that appeals to the people who are interested in keeping secrets, the cryptographers. They look at something that's difficult to do and think, oh, that's good, we can use that as a way to keep secrets, because we know it's hard. And so mathematicians like Whitfield Diffie and Martin Helm in the 1970s saw this problem and realised it gave them a way to build a very secure secret code. Every website has a code number, a large 200-digit number, which is used by the customer's computer to do a calculation which scrambles the customer's credit card number. To crack this code, you have to find the two prime numbers that multiply together to give this 200-digit number. For example... Cracking 15 into the primes 3 times 5 is equivalent to cracking one of these codes. But looking for the primes which divide a 200-digit number is so difficult that it would take the lifetime of the universe to search through all the possibilities. You can use this fact about prime numbers to keep secrets because you can make it incredibly difficult for someone who's trying to eavesdrop on your communication, who wants to know your credit card number to figure out the message you are sending because the only way they can do it is to break down a number into two prime numbers and that will take a thousand years or a million years or forever, depending on how powerful their computer is. So we can have reliable secrets on the internet because of the properties of prime numbers that Hardy was investigating. I sometimes wonder what Hardy would have made of his beautiful, pure world of prime numbers getting dragged into the messy commercial world of e-business. My guess is that he wouldn't have been impressed. For Hardy, mathematics was more of a creative art than a useful science. Thanks for listening to this podcast from BBC Radio 4 with me, Marcus de Sotoy. And if you enjoyed this episode, don't forget you can collect the whole set, all ten episodes of A Brief History of Mathematics, as well as the terms and conditions, can be found at bbc.co.uk forward slash podcasts.